Good stuff. Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for thanks for joining this uh, this exciting uh, exciting I guess you'd say experiment uh, in, in this event. My name is Justin Goonan. I'm the uh, the owner and I guess you'd say creative director of Universal Sports Strength and Conditioning, uh, which also runs the Kilograms Kilometers uh, Strength Remote Coaching Program. Um, very excited today for this. What, what I feel like is a unique and very innovative uh, kind of uh, discussion in kind of bridging together, you know, different sides of sports. So um, inviting in sports coaches to talk about, you know, what it is that their focus is in terms of athlete development in, in specific positions. Uh, and also, you know, uh, have some, some great minds here to help uh, kind of guide the discussion and how, you know, we as strength coaches take that, that feedback. That Having control of your, your, your core muscles, you know, um, and, and Ed and Justin, just in the experts and the scientists they tell me if i'm wrong but if we fire our muscles in the wrong sequence we're you know if you fire your hamstrings before your quads and your glutes you're likely to pull the hamstring so it was a, a process of trying to make sure that players understood how to how to hold themselves in a strong position whilst breathing because sure. that's yeah, important breathing, yeah yeah <laughs> and and then being able to adapt you know so the legs being like uh, shock absorbers in the car, absorbing the pressure. Right. The game puts you out of shape. Tackles, hits, rocks, mauls, scrums, everything hits your body, changes your body. So reshaping is really important. And so that's where the process of the Tower of Power came from, from the feet, through the angles at the knee, through the angles at the hip, engaging the core muscles, engaging the core itself so the trunk is strong, front and back, having a big wide chest, head in a neutral position. Because yeah. too often we've got the head too high, the chin is up, or the head too low, the chin is down. Yeah. Yeah. That is really important, especially when we consider the topic, which is loose head. Because if right. your chin is on your chest, you'll be taking all the pressure through your lower back, not through your legs. So the strength and conditioning coaches out there will, will realize that you don't lift weights with your chin in your chest. You don't do any, all those other things you don't do with your chin in your chest. So there is a transferability there immediately. So let's talk about, well, I put, well, you and I discussed this and when I put it up on the screen originally in our little conversation, you went, people don't do this enough and that's sort out issues prior to matches. What, what are your thoughts on that? Technical issues you need to sort out in the gym and on the field. And one of the biggest bugbears I think since the start of professional rugby, and it's less now, but I still think it can be there, is professional rugby created gym monsters, gym monkeys. Fantastic yeah. in the gym, and you go on the field, where's all that strength gone? So there was no ad adaptation from the gym to the, to the field, uh, which is, you know, looking at uh, Justin's logo there, kilograms to kilometers, yeah. you know, you look at the, uh, the, 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 the deadlift or the squat, the squat to the scrum, yeah. or the power clean to the line-out lift. And that's where I think it's important that the coaches, rugby coaches, strength and conditioning, have a good understanding. I mean, for me, the best strength and conditioning coach is a guy that can be your skills coach as well. Correct. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and so I think whoever... The, um, Ed mentioned basketball earlier and well we don't want people bench pressing the basketball coach has got to lead the strength and conditioning coach and the rugby coach has got to lead the strength and conditioning coach but the rugby coach has got to be able to uh, got to be able to explain what they want yeah you know yeah. if Ed and Justin ask me now we're coming over to America we're going to have 30 players we're playing in three months what are your priorities I'll give them a set of parameters that I want them to deliver for the player to be a better rugby player with their body. Right. And I'm not sure that is still a hundred percent done no, I, correctly. Yeah. Well, for me, I mean, to start off with is that he said that, you know, the communication between the strength coach and that sport coach and, and how paramount it is. And that's something I learned, you know, in college and, and with the, even with the Senate, with the Spurs. But when I got to rugby was with, you know, training Ben Franks was, sitting down with him and, and learning everything that he did and then what he felt was important. Um, used to go to 
coaches and ask, hey, what are three things this player needs to work on? But I also spent a lot of time at practice learning. I mean, I could damn near be a basketball coach after coaching in college, um, being out there on the floor with them all the time, and then with the Spurs, you know, all the time. Always asking questions, always sitting with the coaches and, and, and finding out you know, what they needed and everything else. So hearing that is, is really good to hear that, you know, that communication between there, because we both know that strength conditioning is a general, is general aspect, you know, yeah. how do I make it more specific to that, that rugby player? And so we go back to, you know, it starts at the feet. And if you remember from weightlifting coaching, my first coaching course, Coach Bergner taught, everything starts at the feet, but have healthy feet. Your second slide. This is like a, a preseason meeting <laughs> taken in, in, in the is, middle. Listen, can I just say, this is what every preseason should look, should sound like. Yeah. It should, it should sound like this. And if it isn't this, what on earth is happening? You know? Yeah. 100%. On that point, uh, Eamon, yeah. when Gary and I were with the girls, we used to take all the staff through uh, rugby knowledge. Yeah. Medics, physios, uh, even Jam Man, the manager, who played rugby anyway. Yeah. And... When I started coaching, uh, I was fortunate that I'd got a little bit of a help from a guy, and he also put me on a, a strength and conditioning course with Baller, which was the British Amateur Weightlifting Association back okay. then. And I would recommend any strength and conditioner, they do a rugby ready on world rugby or a level one on whatever their, uh, you know, the USA Eagles do at the moment for their coaching. Uh, uh, you know, or um, the four of us set up a coaching program for strength and conditioners in the USA. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's something I really want to do. You know, and, and uh, in, any strength coach probably worth their salt is, is going to focus on technique more so for the safety of the athlete than anything else. Um, you know, but but I'm, I'm really kind of uh, kind of in awe of, of the term reshape because uh, as as strength coaches, you know, we, we teach so much to be able to hold that technique throughout the entire lift um, that the getting out of shape and getting back into it is something that I would almost say we probably program to avoid. Right. It, it is. Uh, yeah. So, so how do you, how do you take that? And, and, and maybe, and maybe this, this image of Paul Mullen um, and, and you can kind of talk through the, the backstory of this image here. Um, you know, how, how does, how does this kind of, lead in or guide to that reshape ability that that coach smith talked about well for me i mean we're starting when you was talking about that it was it was the t-spine and the scapulas having to you know to work to reshape hips and everything else so my my deal is that if you can't control those muscles then you then you're really not going to be able to reshape them so for me it would be you know making sure that you had control over your scapulas um and there's some exercises that, you know, that I'll do where um, there's one called a scapular walk where I lay on, the, I lay on my back, pull the plate out and walk with my shoulder blades, trying to make sure I can engage them. Same thing for during my stretching, you know, with this, with the bands and, and, and things like that. I'm going to make sure that I'm out, that I'm pulling back, that I'm being able to move. So if you can't control the muscles, then you can't, you know, with, with little stress or no stress, you're not going to be able to control them under under the bigger loads. Um, so Graham, we had um, lineouts are uh, something I love. I just love lineouts. Um, the there's a couple of things on there that should um, interest Justin and guys. Um, agility is the first. Um, th that's something I'm big on. Uh, what are your thoughts on what I put on the screen there? Well, if we were if we were in this meeting for the start of the season. Yeah. And Justin and Ed were developing our players. Before we get to scrums, lineouts, anything else, I would be saying I want every player to be as fast, as mobile, and as quick with their feet as possible, no matter what their size. Because I've said it so often, and I, especially in the English Premiership, I still see a real lack of footwork in the in the in the forwards. Yeah. You know, a hundred and twenty kilo guy running straight at me, I'm going to drop on my ass and trip him up. It's why there's so many red cards. 
is that they're just running at people. If, if they 120 use kilo the guy sidestepping me and I have to put my arm out, I am going to be fearful of dislocating my shoulder trying to stop him. Exactly. So the ability to move your feet quickly, yeah. for, you know, a 120 kilo guy is not going to be a Jason Robinson or a Danielle Waterman. Sure. But we can we can do so much more for forwards in terms of their their preseason work on speed, agility, um, mobility, yeah. sidestep actions, and that then benefits their scrum because your footwork in the scrum is vital. Yeah. And also the speed and agility of lifters to get into position early, move your feet, get solid and drive is so important, which in the perfect world, the tallest guy always lifts at the back and the shorter yeah. guy lifts at the front. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the guy at the back that we think is a number three has done a very good job at boosting, sending him up there. Yeah. Okay. And the front guy to me looks like he's just trying to control it in the air. Now, the most important thing is the rear guy actually catches him on the way down. But uh, I've got a question for Ed and Justin, because if you look at all one, two, three, four, five, six lifters in two pictures, can you tell me any exercise in the gym where you look up when you lift? <laughs> no. For me, I was, you know, listening to, uh, to Graham about the grip strength. And I mean, that's a huge, that's huge. I mean, it's the same as, as we talked about the feet, the hands are at the end of it, you know, open hand strength on that. But, you know, for me, the, the weakness of the thumbs, especially on the pitcher on the left, where his thumbs are on, you know, on that, the, the thumbs are weak. And I mean, even in weightlifting or strongman or anything like that, you're going to hook grip. You're going to grab your thumb because it is so weak. That's, we don't, we don't just overhand grip this way. Cause as soon as the thumb comes apart, the rest of the grip goes. So I always end up, I always end sessions with grip strength. That's why I was, I was having so much fun when Graham was talking about it. Every session ends with grip strength, whether it's open hand grip strength um, on a bar, on plates, finger strength. Um, I do a lot of towel work. I'll put the towel, put the bar in the power rack and put the towel on it and have them step back and hold that towel with their hands. Not like the old school pull-ups we used to do, you know, where you grab the towel this way, you had it taped so it was really nice and pretty. I want right. you to, I want them to grab it like they grab the, like you grab the jersey even on a, on a scrum. Um, uh, last year, so before the thing, so it'd be 2019. Um, Ben was still playing for Northampton and they had a week off the beginning of NFL training camp and Ben flew over and we went up and visited a friend of mine, Evan Marcus with the uh, Cleveland Browns. We spent the week with the Cleveland Browns in training camp in the gym on the field. I mean, they were wonderful to us. And Ben was in amazement of watching these 140, 145 kilo NFL linemen at six foot five, six foot six get down and damn near do the full splits, be able to squat down and sit on their heels, just looking at them. Cause that was one of the things. And in the video, I, I make a comment about Ben, um, you know, doing some flexibility work after we got done squatting. That was something I introduced to, you know, him and a lot of other ones is the ability to be mobile. You, you have to be flexible. You have to be able to be comfortable in those uncomfortable positions. And the only way to do that is to work on it. In the game, you know, you don't know if you're going to get one or if you're going to have to keep going. You're going to, you know, you get, you know, you get that one, you know, you get that one time, you know, you'll end up with, you know, five, you know, five, five meter scrums at the, at the five meter line, you know, with the, with the game clock, you know, winding down. And I, I use that as because Ben um, had one where he did, he had, I think they had uh, probably six or eight five meter scrums. They went to, that I think it started at about 76 minutes and went to 84 minutes. And afterwards I was like, Hey, you know, how was that? He's like, you know, I, I hate when you program 12 and 15 reps, like on a belt squat or, or after the end of their squat, you know, doing a set of like 15 or something like that. When they come back, they come back down in the bar, he goes, but it really made a big difference in, in what I had left in the tank. Yeah. And yeah. off the set piece, 
what were the major components that you discussed with your players and what were the, the, the key performance things you looked for when you looked at your, your front, your props, especially your loose head prop? I think, I think uh, what this comes down to is uh, understanding your role and responsibility. And, and I, would, I would make that a lot broader as well, that if we were a staff team of two coaches, two S&C or a physio, whatever it looked like, we all have to understand our role and responsibility right because we have to synergize we have to communicate which we've talked about all the way through but then you've got to understand the positional requirements um and uh we we tried to play a game which which was a fusion i still see too much rugby played where you have the backs do this and the forwards do that yeah and gary and i tried to create a game where my role in the scrum, my role in the line out, whether it be forward or back, understand that. And then everybody had to be able to do everybody else's job. So, for example, uh, one Six Nations, Rochelle Clark, as a loose head prop, made more scrum half clearing passes than any other player in the Six Nations apart from the scrum half. <laughs> I was trying to, I try to keep things interesting. Instead of just always, you know, doing this, doing that, doing this. I mean, obviously, we're going to lift. We're going to work on getting strong. But this, so the two bottom ones with Paul, this was done after he was done squatting, after he was done doing power cleans. He had to go outside under with some fatigue in him and do these runs. And I'm, I'll, I'll actually time you on five and ten meter sprints after you get done squatting. You know. Yeah. Is the same thing, is, I mean, what's that? Oh, uh, sorry but, to interrupt. I, I was just going to say, you know, you're talking about, uh, especially these two photos of, of Paul uh, being able to get down low into that position, touch the cone. We saw earlier the photo of him uh, squatting. Um, and and, and I'll, I'll, I want to kind of refer back to that. We don't have to, to, to throw it up, but refer back to it. Um, it I, I know this story because I, I was talking to you, talking to Paul throughout that whole journey. Um, give us a little bit of background. Obviously, you know, this bottom right photo, <laughs> you could almost kind of use that as a textbook image of, for, you know, the, the, the pro agility. Um, mm -hmm. But Paul, Paul wasn't always able to do that, was he? You know, that, that <laughs> picture of him squatting earlier, he wasn't able to do that. I mean, no. where, where did Paul start and, and, and how did, Paul's, you know, how did y'all get up to that point? Paul started... I was surprised he could tie his shoes. He was so inflexible and tight. <laughs> I don't use stones as often as I use sandbags. Sandbags are a little safer. If I drop that on my uh, on my foot, I'm going to break my foot. Sandbag, not so bad. Sandbag also allows you to have to get underneath it as it starts giving. I'm going to pull it pull it back into me and hug it back in. So I always taught you know I always tell the guys you know my hips are really hard engaged because that's that's about halfway. I'm going to take that stone almost all the way to my shoulder. So I don't, yeah. And uh, the same. I see something else in that photograph. So uh, there's lots of things that you could apply that to in many mm -hmm. sports. You know, the, the grip strength, the, the wrestling, the 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 the, the sort of um, all body strength. But right. I'm looking at your face, and there's a lot of mental resilience in there. Yes, a lot of I mental strength. Think, you know, I think that's one of the things I would say to. Uh, an s and I want them in the gym suffering. I, I want them to understand that at times it is tough and you have to dig in and I'm going to make you do it again and you're going to cry and I'm going to come yeah. back and make you do it again and you're going to cry again, but you will get over it. You know, it's just the mental resilience, I think, that is something that the, the strength and conditioning coaches can help with as well. My final thought really, Justin, is, is to do with relationships between the reason why Graham and I agree to this is that we are both of a similar mind that if you're blessed to have access to to a specialist in any field um not always in a professional environment so if you're a, if you're a local men or women's d1 d3 side doesn't matter if you have access to a person who works for the press if you have access to a person who works for media somebody who, you've got to utilize them if you're a professional club you know, if you're not using using your pub, your performance staff, 
you know, all of them, if they aren't in the room at the same time, at least twice a week, you're going to fail. You are going to fail. It's not going to work. One of the things you always find is that you get players coming in from different parts of the world saying things like, um, well, we didn't do this where I came from. Yeah. And they went, well, th well, the reason why that ha that's allowed to happen is that the, the people in charge aren't going, yes, I know what you did what you did before. You know, a couple of things. One, you'd be still there, you know, performing in your own country rather than coming over here if you were actually any good. And secondly, we want everybody to perform in the same way, in the same manner. It's a team game, not an individual game. And I have given the authority to my strength staff, my analysis people, my media people to do it this way. You know, I am very interested in what you have to say and you can give me feedback, but we're doing it this way for a reason. And if, that, if the management isn't powerful enough and you as SNC staff don't get the support you deserve because you're basically, you're the extension of the head coach. You know, you're part of the coaching team. It's important. You can't be on the outside. You know, when we're making decisions about, about performance statistics and KPIs and performance indicators, and we're setting them all, and then not and ignoring the, the S&C stuff, ignoring the, 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 the GPS stuff that's on the back of the shirt and so on, that's insanity. Listening, listening to that, yeah, my experience, not so good, um, where it's mostly, hey, you know, um, I don't have an accent and I didn't play, so we're not going to, we're not going to listen. Um, no communication with, with that, never part of, part of the coaching staff meetings and everything else, not being relied on for what I know. The one thing that um, a lot of, uh, you know, people don't understand is go to football or, you know, because that's the sport where, you know, you're recruiting out of the college the most. When a football NFL scout comes in to visit the college team, it goes and sees the head coach, obviously, first. And the next person he goes and sees is the person that spends the most time with that athlete in college. And that's the strength conditioning coach. Yes. Mm -hmm. The strength coach is a strength coach. Even in the NBA, I never got sent out of the locker room when the players needed to have a meeting without the coaches. You know, I, I, I'm that bridge between between them. You know, there's things you don't repeat, or, or and there's things that are repeated. That that's that's completely you know that's a little bit different. Um, if the players are just venting, you know, you're not going to go out and run and oh, you know, so and so said this, so and so said that. Um, but I do have a I, I do have a bigger um, bigger influence on them, or big or, a, I don't know influence, but. I listen and, and communication is, 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 is a, uh, a thing that's non-existent where I was at. Um, and uh, it's something the players bitch about still. Um, but communication is also the other way. I have to listen as well. Um, and, 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 I, and a lot of times, one, we as strength coaches get siloed into the weight room. But I think second to that, the strength coaches silos themselves into the weight room. And, and I would challenge the, the strength coaches who maybe you didn't play rugby, maybe you're just a fan, but get out. And, and like Ed talked about, be right next to that scrum coach whenever they're given their scrum session, because you're going to hear coaching cues. You're going to hear, you know, little adjustments and things that are going to help you better understand. I mean, I mean we, we talked about, you know, coach <laughs> talked about what his tight head is. I was never going to be a tight head. I mean, come on, really? Um, I, I, I might could play tight head in a U14 comp right now, but, <laughs> um, but you know, because I can't get in there and feel it and, and shape and reshape, I, I've got to, I've got to learn it and hear it and watch it. And, and, you know, that's what I would challenge the, the strength coaches who are saying, I never played the sport. I don't have anything to offer. Well, I would say, you know, BS. Uh, because you understand biomechanics, you understand, uh, you know, movement and, and, and movement efficiency and movement quality. And you can learn just as much as, as Ed mentioned, you can learn just as much from those technical coaches as they can learn from you. And, and it's, it, it's that fresh, that rebel idea that, that, you know, fresh perspective that you bring to it that can help, you know, help revolutionize 
uh, not just a team's performance, but an individual athlete's, um, you know, development pathway. So, um, so all that being said, geez, we've, um, we're coming up on the two hour mark here. So, yeah. um, Maybe you were wrong. <laughs> well, oh yeah. Good luck. Look, knocking this down to a tight 30 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah, said right. to me earlier, Justin has allowed two hours, but I don't think it'll take that long. I didn't think it would, but oh, well, what was I thinking? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, and, and, and I'll say this too. I mean, Eamon and, and, and coach Smith, I mean, you've, you've definitely set the bar high for, for any future conversations. You know, yeah. we obviously do want to expand this to, to second row, to back row, you know, to other positions, not just within rugby, but also in, in other sports as well. Hence the strength four. Um, so, so thank you both very much for, uh, for joining this, this uh, first, this initial episode uh, for contributing and, and uh, you know, thank you. Uh, thank you for all that you're continuing to do.